rainfall coming down, striking my vehicle. Woo -hoo. You can see the uh, fogged up windows there. It is epic. I keep waiting for Noah to slip on by with a couple giraffe, a few lions, and uh, who knows what else. Well, I tell you, there's going to be some severe flooding here in central Pennsylvania as a consequence of this massive storm, which has hit the United States, made its way all the way across the continental United States, and it's here yesterday and today, uh, a brief period this morning when it didn't rain, but it is pouring once again now. Woo, baby. One thing I can say about it is that gray sky back there has made it much easier to see me on the screen today than it was yesterday, but thanks for tuning in. Uh, today, I'm going to talk <clears throat> about a number of issues, excuse me, the... Uh, <clears throat> targeting and taking out of uh, Iranian officials in Syria. Also talk a little bit about a strange rule by a South African commercial airline not letting people take potty breaks on the plane. That's an odd one. In addition to that, we're going to talk about Caitlin Clark and the Iowa Hawkeyes. Incredible victory last night in the Elite Eight, sending them back to the Final Four, defeating their nemesis, the Louisiana State University Tigers last night. Angel Reese, who fouled out of the game, on a difficult charging call, but arguably it was a charging call. In a game which saw a lot of physical contact and not many penalties called on many of these things, uh, the game held pretty late, hinged on LSU coming back. They reduced the deficit from 13 down to 6 points. That was 11-point deficit when they essentially had a 5-point play. Shortly before this, Caitlin Clark had launched a massive long-distance 3-pointer and was hit on the hand, which should have been a penalty, and 3 free throws, but instead no penalty was called. Shortly after that, um, Caitlin Clark herself actually hit a player who fired a three. The three went in and hit same thing. She hit her after after she released the ball, and so she was awarded a penalty for a four point for a conversion. She missed it, but LSU recovered the ball on the rebound and wound up with a basket, giving them five points, reducing the 13-point lead to 11, and then it was reduced down to just six points. However, the Iowa Hawkeyes held on <clears throat> and won the game last night. Exciting game. I'm waiting to see what the uh, actual viewership was last year. And the title game was 9.9 .9 million people tuned in for the women's NCAA final. Well, this was an Elite Eight game between the same two teams, a rematch of last year. But let's get into South Africa's political events. Excuse me. <clears throat> oh, boy, it's nasty out here. Anyway, let's get into South Africa's political events and talk specifically about a story that appears, uh, was this in News 24, or was uh, I think it's News 24, and talk about Pete Retief and what's going on there. So this story will tell you all you need to know about how people vote and why that is problematic. So Mkondo residents grapple with illegal dumping and generally effed up town ahead of polls. Mkondo, or Pete Retief, residents in Pumalanga live among piles of rubbish as illegal dumping is pervasive and the local municipality is seemingly incapable of dealing with refuse removal. Road infrastructure is also a problem. Residents say they're looking to vote differently in 29 May in hopes of change in the situation. Unfortunately, they won't vote for a party that will actually change the situation. The streets are quiet, but one family and Konyane family are cleaning their yard. A few meters away from their tidy yard, just across the road, is a pile of rubbish in what has become one of several illegal dumping sites in the area. Her husband, Johan, with a broom in his hand and who was equally as frustrated by the pile's rubbish, said he'd given up on reporting the matter to the ward counselor. As such, the couple have been living in Poso for more than, an informal settlement, more than 25 years is considering voting differently in the upcoming election. The family's six share a dilapidated pit latrine after they were told to pay 2,000 rand to repair their toilet. They didn't have the money, so they left it unrepaired. Lena, that's the wife, said, we have no hope. We built the toilet in 2017, but nothing has been done to repair it. Nothing has been done. This is the problem with turning people into wards of the state. Why aren't you doing something to repair it? It's not up to the community or the state to repair your toilet. It's your responsibility. Now, she said this is an everyday thing. It's very bothersome. We had a fence that the government had given to us. Once again, the fence was given to them. Given to them. Yes. Uh... But they took it, and that was a blow because they used to have a vegetable garden. After the fence was stolen, I stopped gardening. So the Nkonyane family sat back and allowed the government to make them wards of the state, dependent on the state for their lives and the livelihood, and allow them to give them a fence. The government gave them a fence, and they built a life off of that, having a garden. But then the government took the fence back, as the government can do. 
This is what happens when you surrender your liberty, your freedom, for exchange for goods, services, or cash. In this house, we always vote. We make sure. But it looks like it's not working out. We might have to change who we vote for. We don't see anything. Why are we voting? Well, you're idiots because you keep voting for the same morons, the corrupt, thieving bastards you put in office for the past three decades. And look, that's not exclusive to South Africa. We say the same thing in Germany, the same thing in Brussels, the same thing in London, and certainly here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and in Washington, D.C. You vote for the same idiots. Bob Casey running for the Senate again after 18 years of doing nothing in the Senate. He's basically been a placeholder, collecting a huge paycheck for 20 years. That's all he's done. But he wants to run again, and he'll probably win. It's twisted. Also living in Cunyane's yard are Soiso Delamini, 28, and Tulani Mota, who's 37. We are suffering here, said Delamini, adding that the residents dumped their rubbish next to the street. Mota had strong words for the municipality whose existence he wasn't even sure of. Pete Retief is effed up, he said. Of course, he said the explicit word. And isn't it interesting that the black residents of Pete Retief call the town Pete Retief, not Mkondo, not this fantasy illusion by the ANC's cultural genocide against Afrikaners. A drive through the township reveals several heaps of rubbish among the houses, a reflection of the Auditor General's report that only 33.8% of residents in Mkondo, Pete Retief, received weekly refuse removal back in 2022. It's probably worse than that now. This is what you get when you vote for people who act against your interest. According to the Democratic Alliance and AFRI Forum, the Mkondo local municipality's landfill sites have been in contravention of the National Environmental Waste Act for more than six years. No wonder trash is piling up because, wow, the rain is getting even harder. Goats roam the pothole streets freely. A resident, Sibongile Fakuda, said she was desperate for this settlement to finally get a road. She said she had brought their plight to the ward council's attention two weeks ago. I'm very excited about the election because we need development in the area. We want roads. We want electricity. We also need the price of food to decrease. Everything is expensive. In other words, give me, give me, give me, give me. We want, we want. You owe us. We are entitled. You must provide for us. No, I'm sorry. That's not how life works, folks. So, asked if she read or listened to broadcast around party manifestos. Fakunde said, we can't even listen to broadcast because when something important will be discussed or aired, we have load shedding. Now that I empathize with her. She said she's also looking to vote for a party that would address the influx of undocumented migrants into South Africa because clearly she's concerned about them taking a job that she doesn't have. <laughs> now, that's one story. Philip DeVette in News 24, also known affectionately as Propaganda 24, said South Africa won't vote the ANC out because of COVID, and that's a tragedy. Now, Philip DeVette, sometimes I take issue with some of his uh, op-eds, but this one largely hits the mark, not entirely, but I'm going to read from it some of the highlights. The national lockdown went into effect at the end of March of 2020. It's the cigarette and booze ban that most people recall when you talk about the bad old days of Rona. What the hell the government could possibly have been thinking as it stood nearly alone in insisting that it absolutely positively had to ban cigarette sales to save lives and insisted they must have the power to act in such a capricious way again. In fact, they took it to the courts to do that. The ANC's approach was to shut down the entire economy in one fell swoop, which was moronic. It's what communists and totalitarian fascists do. Then they created loopholes for the goods and services necessary to keep people from starving to death, allowing, say, the sale of food and eventually some types of clothing. Allowing the sale of food was easy. Governance was by instantaneous decree. So the government published a decree saying that all food manufacturing retailing was allowed, except it wasn't. A minister noticed that some shops had dared to interpret all food to include hot food, such as pies and roast chicken, and fumed the jolly they knew full well that these people were out selling these goods. So, <laughs> and they knew that they were breaking the law. Well, unfortunately, Philip, that it's not a law. The government did not pass a law giving it the authority to shut down the economy, Mr. DeVette. It's not a law. They were breaking policy. Yeah which later became true when the rules were updated to allow the sale of all food, excluding cooked hot food. And notice Philip DeVette corrects himself in the next sentence, or he doesn't see the dichotomy here of claiming that it was a violation of the law when it was not a violation of the law. It was a violation of unconstitutional policies implemented, imposed 
upon South Africans and Americans and people throughout the world. Rules were updated to allow the sale of all food, excluding cooked hot food. So you couldn't have takeaway. South Africa was treated to governance by tantrums and petulance, and it never really got better, nor did the government learn any appreciable lessons from the whole fiasco. And that is the most important and the most concise and precise statement that Philip DeVette makes here. South Africa was treated to governance by tantrums and petulance, and it never really got better, nor did the government learn any appreciable lessons from the whole fiasco. Spot on. Well stated right there. There is absolutely no reason to believe South Africa won't again be treated to emergency rules based on, yes, we said all, but not like that. And we felt it was a good idea, and that's all you need to know. And la, 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 can't hear you. That's exactly right, Philip DeVette. Now, here's one thing I do take exception to him, because Philip DeVette clearly doesn't understand the politics of the United States, but he comments on it. Rona did not move the needle in the U.S. next U.S. elections in the same year, 2020. Well, in fact, that's not true. If, in fact, Donald Trump did not win the events of 2020, it is in large measure because of the lies told about the Chinese flu. The lies told about what was going on in the country. The media claiming that Trump claimed that you take and inject yourself with some substance, which he never said. The media lying and blaming him for a pestilence that came from Asia when he took steps to actually stop it before any other country in the world. While they praised the actions of Jacinda Ardern, Mr. Ed from New Zealand, the coward who fled from governance rather than stand up and watch her party fail epically because it was wildly unpopular for its unconstitutional criminal actions during the Rona pandemic. Jacinda Ardern was praised by the leftists. Oh, she did such a great job. But I have blown apart that entire narrative a few years ago when I made a video which I explicitly showed the timeline of what Trump did and what Jacinda Ardern did when armed with the same information. And in every instance, Trump was two weeks, 10 days to two weeks faster in taking action than Mr. Ed was in New Zealand. Yet she was praised for her actions. Never mind the fact that her actions were counterproductive and violated the rights of citizens, while Taiwan successfully fought against the pandemic. But they were ignored because the Chinese communists did not want them as part of the World Health Organization annual conference on infectious disease. Inconvenient truths, that's what these are, inconvenient truths. So Mr. DeVette is 100% incorrect. The Rona did in fact tip the scales of 2020 here in the United States when it came to the choosing event in November. He's completely wrong. I don't know where he gets his information from. I was here, I lived it. And I covered those events. So, he says, South Africa will become yet another country where the mismanagement of a scary, big impact, literally killer event means far less than whether Jacob Zuma feels sufficiently loved within the ANC. So, Rona means less because they forgot about it, about people really care about how Jay-Z feels in the ANC. The message will be as clear as it has been to incumbents and challengers everywhere. Voters have short memories and a limited perspective on their own self-interest. And this is one major reason why load shedding remains in effect. And it's only now being addressed in a serious fashion by the corrupt, thieving kleptocracy of the African National Congress. Because they know voters can be stupid and have the memories of piss ants and will forget the erosion of liberty, the theft of resources, the imprisonment of people for committing no crimes by the corrupt, venal government of the ANC. All they'll remember is, can they turn the lights on? Can they watch multi-choice? Can they get airtime on their SIM card? And can they get Chibuku or Castle Lager? That's what they'll be worried about on March 29th or May 29th. Not anything else. And that's the bottom line here. And in that respect, Philip DeVette is correct. From their resigned size, which came as little surprise to the theorists who have watched people everywhere vote themselves poor and less secure, and to worse corruption for all of time. Yep, that's what happens. People vote against their own self-interest over and over again, the world over. But COVID, Rona, governments wrote their own rules, most with an unprecedented level of freedom to do so from debate before and censure after. Countries declared themselves fortresses, governments that is, then dictated their internal affairs to, or in the case of South Africa, the level of what kind of shoes you could buy. Remember the lunacy, you couldn't buy open-toed shoes because we all know the main vector for that pestilence was the big toe, the big toe. Mm -hmm. Yep. And he says, South Africa's government 
has showed itself to be authoritarian, petty, and incompetent and not the kind of people you want around when the next major emergency crashes down. Everyone involved in the political process should be told as much in the poll numbers to reduce the odds of the same thing happening again. That they won't is yet another piece of Rona tragedy. I agree. I agree. Absolutely 100%. Mr. Green Jeans, welcome. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, disturbing news, a dramatic decline in the usage of condoms by men in South Africa. Will we see another uptick of STIs, in particular, HIV. South African government distributed 45% fewer male condoms in 2022 than it did in 2018. And that is a problem in and of itself. Why are governments handing out condoms? They don't hand out penises. You don't go to the government. Go, Can I have a new penis? I'd like one. It's a little bit larger and more girth. Governments don't give penises. So why should they be giving condoms? Who thinks that's appropriate? You should buy condoms. Or a charitable organization should give them out to you. But taxpayers shouldn't be buying a condom so you can have intercourse. That's insane. Absolutely insane, folks. But we've been doing it for decades. PEPFAR, spending tons of money for ABC, abstinence. Be faithful and condomize. And we buy those condoms so you can stick them on your willy. Hey, if you like willies, we've got a blanket for you to cover it up. But 45% fewer condoms handed out by the government of South Africa. The total number of male condoms distributed dropped by over 300 million from 728 million in March of 2018 to February of 2019. Wow. 300 million less condoms. Only 403 million condoms. Female condom supply also declined, but not as sharply. The full extent of the actual decline in condom supply across the country over the past five years has not been previously reported. The Democratic Alliance, though, did raise alarm bells about condom supply challenges back in Al-Khotang in April of last year. Well, good on the DA for telling people that there are enough condoms out there. Good Lord. <laughs> My goodness. Well, someone commented on this at the beginning of the broadcast, folks. Speaker Nosizivwe Mapisa Nakula's urgent bid to block a potential arrest has failed. The Pretoria High Court has struck off the role National Assembly Speaker Nosa Zivwe Mapisa Nakola's urgent application to interdict law enforcement from arresting her. Yep, she turned to the court to challenge how the search and seizure warrant by the investigating director was obtained and the recent operation itself at her Joburg home. There's not a single fact set out as to why the future arrest would be unlawful, seemingly because there is a weak case made out. Yet the applicant does not know what case has been set out, and this is pure speculation. I can make no finding on such speculation, said ruling judge Sulet Potterill. So, no Sazivwe might be getting a perp walk sometime soon. That's right, folks. The Speaker of Parliament, the incompetent former defense minister, may find herself on a perp walk. <laughs> now, here's a story that may, keep, may disturb you. I have flown, of course, with Airlink and also with Fly Saf Air. All right. I've never flown with Chem Air or Sem Air, however you pronounce them, mostly because they don't have flights when I need them, where I need them. So, no toilet breaks allowed mid-flight? Is Chem Air's new policy a trend or torture? <laughs> Imagine this. You're aboard, is, 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 is Arctic here, because he's a pilot. You're aboard a small commercial plane, having been on board for nearly two hours. Suddenly, when nature calls, you urgently need to use the bathroom. However, the only toilet on the plane is sealed shut with tape, with a sign declaring it unserviceable. That's what will happen if you choose to fly on a smaller plane with commercial airline Sam Air or Chem Air. One of the aircraft used is a Chem Air Beechcraft 1900 Delta. It's a twin turboprop engine with a range of 2,500 kilometers. It can carry two crew members and 19 passengers to destinations such as Joburg to Maun in Botswana. <laughs> I'm not making this up, folks. It's not an April, Day, April Fool's joke. This is a real story. So, Miles van der Molen, the Chem Air Chief Executive Officer, says that they have found that encouraging passengers to plan their needs on either side of the flight is the most successful strategy. Really? And what do you do with people with incontinence? What do you do with people who have bladder issues, who are have colostomy bags? And the reality is that male passengers are being, let's see, uh, excuse me, asked if the airline would open the toilet in case of emergency. The CEO said this would not be allowed. So even in a case of emergency, you're supposed to soil yourself on their flight. Soil yourself, that's Chem Air's response. Uh, and the reality is that male passengers are being forced to relieve themselves into a bottle in front of female passengers. 
Wow. I mean, that's a that's a criminal act here in America. You whip out your willy. Willies, willies. We whip out willies right there on a flight. You're going to go to jail for exposing yourself. Apparently, in Cam Air, you can whip it out. You know, when a problem comes along, you must whip it. <laughs> whip it. Whip it good. <laughs> Sorry. Props to Devo. Yes. Um, when you got a wee out of chem flight, you must whip it out. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So, and the, um, Chem Air operates 26 aircraft from or Tambo and is popular for tourists who are headed to safari destinations who are flying in on British Airways, Gutter Airways, Ethiopian, Egypt Air, Pro Flight Zambia, and Lava Mozambique. Passengers are warned before boarding the use of toilets is prohibited on flight. <laughs> the airline is a full member of the IATA, the International Air Transport Association. However, IATA policies suggest a functioning toilet on member airlines carrying passengers. But according to Kim Air CEO, this is not a binding regulation. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something. It also isn't binding. Someone who's got incontinence. That's not binding. <coughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Well, I won't be flying Cam Air anytime soon. I'm telling you that. <laughs> well, Iran vows a deadly suspected Israeli airstrike on its consulate will not go unanswered. Without evidence that Israel did it, they presume that Israel did it. Let's be honest, they probably did do it. Iran and one of its key proxies vowed Tuesday to respond to a strike widely attributed to Israel that demolished Iran's consulate in the Syrian capital of Damascus and killed seven, including two Iranian generals. At least three senior commanders and four officers overseeing Iran's covert operations in the Middle East were killed on Monday when Israeli warplanes struck a building in Damascus that is part of the Iranian embassy complex, according to Iranian and Syrian officials. The strike in Damascus, the Syrian capital, appeared to be amongst the deadliest attacks in a years-long shadow war between Israel and Iran that has included the assassinations of Iranian military leaders and nuclear scientists. Iran's state TV reported today that the country's Supreme National Security Council, a key decision-making body, met late Monday. Yeah, they met late Monday and decided on a required response to the strike. The report said the meeting was chaired by President Ibrahim Rasi, but provided no further details. The cowardly crime will not go unanswered, Rasi said uh, from his office's website, according to Agence France, France Presse, AFP. But the thing is, um, the cowardly acts of terror supported and perpetrated by Iran should get punished. So Israel simply responding. AFP reports that Iran's supreme leader, the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, said on his official website, Israel will be punished. The airstrike in Syria killed General Mohammad Reza Zahidi, who led the elite Quds force in Lebanon and Syria until 2016, according to Iran's Revolutionary Guard. It also killed Zahidi's deputy general Mohammad Hadi Hajamarani and five other officers. Israel, which rarely acknowledges strikes against Iranian targets, said it had no comment on the latest attack in Syria. <laughs> well, good for the IDF. No comment. Don't mess with the Israelis, man. Don't mess with the Israelis. The Baltimore Key Bridge collapse. The Dali ship owners deny responsibility for the crash as temporary channels have been opened. Wow. Wow. Ship's owner Grace Ocean Private Limited and operator Synergy Marine PTE denied any fault over the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse that claimed the lives of six construction workers. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen the video and it seems pretty obvious that the dolly is responsible for collapsing the structure and for the death of six workers. It's not UPS. It's not China Southern. It's not you. It's not me. It is this company. Grace Ocean Private Limited, but they're denying responsibility. In federal court filing yesterday, the ship's owner, Grace Ocean Private Limited, and operator, Synergy Marine, denied any fault or neglect over the collapse that claimed the lives of six construction workers. Now, the owners of the Dolly ship have denied all responsibility, and they are seeking a cap of just $43.7 million for any lawsuit payouts. The bridge collapse was not due to any fault, neglect, or want of care on the part of the ship owner and operator. The vessel or any persons or entities whose acts the ship owner and operator may be responsible for the following says. Are they high? Are they high? Have they not seen the video? Are they not aware that they are responsible for collapsing that bridge and causing the deaths? That's manslaughter. How can they claim they're not responsible? Their ship ran into the damn bridge. Are they going to say, well, the bridge jumped out in front of us? 
Well, there you go. That's a novel defense. But you know, in Joe Biden's America, anything is possible. I mean, we have Donald Trump convicted of a crime he didn't commit and then given a fine that is 45 times larger than the swindler Bernie Madoff got for defrauding hundreds of thousands of people their life savings and investments. 10 million was the bond for Bernie Madoff. Donald Trump, 453 million. Anything's possible. Yes, but apparently, ladies and gentlemen, the Dolly ship crew was not responsible for the key bridge collapse. The bridge jumped out in front of them. <laughs> wow. Singaporean firm whose ship took down the Baltimore Bridge just cited an 1851 maritime law to cap liability at just $44 million. The owner and manager of a cargo ship that rammed into Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge before the span collapsed last week filed a court petition yesterday seeking to limit their legal liability for the deadly disaster. The company's limitation of liability petition is a routine but important procedure for cases litigated under U.S. maritime law. A federal court of Maryland ultimately decides who's responsible and how much they owe for what could become one of the costliest catastrophes of its kind. Singapore-based Grace Ocean Private Limited owns the dolly, the vessel that lost power before it slammed into the bridge early last Tuesday. Synergy Marine PTE Limited is also based in Singapore, is the ship's manager. Their joint filing seeks to cap the company's liability at roughly $43.6 million. It estimates that the vessel itself is valued at up to $90 million and it was owed over $1.1 million in income from the freight that was on the ship. The estimate also deducts two major expenses, at least $28 million in repair costs and at least $19.5 million in salvage costs for the ship alone, not for the bridge. The company's filed under a pre-Civil War provision of an 1851 maritime law that allows them to seek to limit their liability to the value of the vessel's remains after casualty. It is a mechanism that's been employed as defense in many of the most notable marine maritime disasters, said James Mercanton, Mercant, a New York-based attorney with over 30 years of experience in maritime law. Well, Baltimore opens a temporary route around the Key Bridge. The temporary alternate channel will be able to accommodate some barges and tugboats, but not larger vessels. Officials in Baltimore opened a temporary channel Monday to help restore some traffic in and out of the Port of Baltimore, one of the nation's busiest commercial shipping hubs. The alternate channel will allow some essential vessels to bypass wreckage from the collapse Francis Scott Key Bridge, which has been blocking the harbor's main channel since it was hit by a giant cargo ship, the Dolly, last week. Temporary channels announced late Sunday by state and federal authorities, leading the disaster response and confirmed in a news conference on Monday afternoon. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Donald John Trump has posted a $175 million bond in the ridiculous case against him. Former President Donald Trump has posted $175 million bond as he appeals the judgment against him in the New York civil fraud case brought by State Attorney General Letitia James. Trump's bond pauses any action that James could take against his properties in response to the judgment until at least September when the state appeals court also set a schedule to hear his appeal for the $464 million verdict against him. The bond is underwritten by Knight Specialty Insurance, a California-based insurance company, but the court document does not list the collateral that Trump used to secure the bond. Last month, Trump said in a news conference he would use cash to cover the bond, but also claimed that he wanted to use cash to fund his re-election re campaign. Yet, asked if he planned to start personal funds into, into his presidential campaign, Trump said, first of all, it's none of your business, <laughs> before adding, I might do that, I have the option. <laughs> the bond amount was lowered by several hundred million dollars by state appeals court after Trump's attorneys argued that covering the full bond was not feasible. Well, Caitlin Clark leads Iowa back to the final four, scoring 41 points in a dramatic 94 to 87 win over defending champ Louisiana State. Caitlin Clark put up another sensational performance to carry Iowa to its second straight Final Four, also setting all-time NCAA tournament records with nine three-point field goals. She barely missed the 10th one, three or four shots at it. So she tied the record in nine. She also set the record for assist in an NCAA tournament in this game. Wow. The Hawkeye superstar guard, whose record-breaking exploits have brought unprecedented attention to women's basketball, as I said, made nine three-pointers and finished with 41 points and 12 assists as Iowa knocked defending national champion LSU out of the tournament with a 94-87 victory on Monday night. In a game I did get to watch the second half of. It was amazing. Um, it's amazing to be back in the Final Four. It's so hard to get back there, Clark said. The region was really hard, the regional competition. But we told ourselves we are the one seed for a reason. Top seed Iowa, 33 wins, four losses, will play Paige Bokers and the University of Connecticut in the national semifinals Friday night in Cleveland. Monday's highly anticipated matchup was a rematch of last year's national championship game, won by LSU, which drew a record of 9.9 .9 million viewers. Wow. 
while Swiss banking giant UBS will launch a share buyback of up to $2 billion, ladies and gentlemen, $2 billion. UBS on today announced a new share repurchase program of up to $2 billion, with up to $1 billion of that total expected to take place in 2024. As previously communicated in 2024, we expect to repurchase up to $1 billion US dollars of our shares, commencing after the completion of the merger of UBS and Credit Suisse, which is expected to occur by the end of the second quarter. Our ambition is for share repurchase to exceed our pre-acquisition level by 2026. The new program follows completion of a 2022 buyback during which 298.5 million of its shares were purchased. They represented 8.62% of the stock worth 5.2 billion. So, so the um, UBS is doing a great favor to its shareholders by reducing the number of shares, thereby increasing the value of each share. Brilliant use of funds. But it is interesting to see that UBS has money after the difficulty swallowing Credit Suisse recently. Well, folks, let's see what you've had in the commentary and in the chats here as we go along here. So Pip Jacobus is here, Org Fenter, Pierre Orban, Brian Lawrenson, Andreo Fick, uh, Teresa, uh, Mike is here, tardiness, it's okay. Came in a canoe, yeah, Mike is also getting rained on. Speaker has been chucked out of court, yep. Um, Garrett is here, welcome Garrett Hester, Sue Walsh, Ashley Engelbrecht, Val Cooper, Nick Muller, Benaja Kwa, what's going on, where are you? Well, I'm in my car doing a mobile edition once again. Once again, I'm doing consulting services, helping out the US Army War College this week, as I've pointed out previously. And there's Charles Van Onselen. Um, I enjoy your commitment to bring us the news, says Shawnee Shabe. Well, you're welcome. Shawnee, I give it my best. I give it my blood shower to do this. A bit of rain, I see where you are, says Brendan. As you say, voters have short memories everywhere. Yep, they sure do. And they will not punish people who deserve to be punished. Is it raining? Yes, it is. It's not just raining. It's pouring, coming down in sheets, dogs and cats. It's not just raining dogs and cats. I think it's raining elephants, giraffes, and hippos, too. It's just pouring here. Mr. Green Jeans, watch the skate from Pretoria. I have that video. Uh, you're welcome. All right. What else we got here? Not exactly heavy security there. <laughs> okay. Wooden keys. It used to be free condoms at every municipal clinic. Allison says, good evening. Join Jim, so we'll be late in some evenings. Okay, well, hopefully that's good for your cardiovascular system. Every college had a Planned Parenthood folded into their campus medical service since the 70s at least. Oh, geez. Uh, what else? Um, we had banana-flavored government-issued condoms a while ago, says Nick. <laughs> Don't worry if it's a Boeing. You can just use the escape hatch to pee out of it. Uh, uh, best thing is wear diapers on the short flight, says <laughs> Val. No, thank you. Pretty overcast, yeah. Biden and his fishing village inbreds, yeah, exactly. Bridge accident was a cyber attack. New intel out. Well, Garrett, um, there have been claims that that's that's what happened. If in fact that is the case, then the shipping company won't be to blame. Um, cyber attack. That's pretty scary because think of what that could do to infrastructure the world over. Well, the bridge was racist. Well, yes, it was named after Francis Scott Key, a slave owner, and a man who also defended slaves. According to Phil Lyman, the bridge collapsed because of DEI. Well, I seriously doubt that's the case. <laughs> what does DEI have to do with it? <laughs> the bridge is manned by Singaporeans. What DEI are they using? I remember, the ship was under the command of two Baltimore pilots. Um, I did not see that. How was it under command of two Baltimore pilots? Were they on the ship with them? And when would they have gotten off the ship? Um, that's that's I've not seen that story. Um, Indian pilots. No, they're 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 Singaporeans. Or yeah, it was Indians, excuse me, I said Singapore's Indians. Uh the pilots are still controlled by Baltimore if they subcontract or not. Well, they're not controlled by Baltimore. The harbor master is who's responsible for that. But they were in the channel headed out. Now I don't know where the harbor master's responsibility ends, if it's before the key bridge or after the key bridge, but clearly the harbor master of Baltimore does not control the Patapsco River for its full length or the Chesapeake Bay. That's not under his purview. So I'm not sure who's responsible at that stage. It may still be the Baltimore Harbor Master. Um, okay, Gus. Okay. All right, we got here. Uh, Ron is in from Bloemfontein, and there's Maryland. So, oh, well, it's a lot wet, Maryland. And Nick says, thanks for sacrificing your lunch. Lori Letton is in from Finland. Where have you been hiding, Lori? I've stopped covering Finland because you're never here. No, I'm just teasing. Just teasing. Very rainy Star Valley, Wyoming this morning. It looks like rain. Ah, uh, <laughs> Matt, that's, yeah, yeah, Matt, Matt fell for my April Fool's joke that I moved to Star Valley, Wyoming. <laughs> that's a good one, Matt. Good to see you remember it. Star Valley is a beautiful spot, folks. Beautiful mountains um, nestled into the border of Idaho in the western Wyoming and quaking Aspen on the banks, or on the, on the ridges of the Rockies. Beautiful stuff there. 
Okay, what else? Standard procedure, get taken off by chopper. Um, says Mark. Um, you're familiar with the operations of the Port of Baltimore. Well, then you're more familiar than I am, even though I've been there many times. Yeah, the harbor pilot was not on board, okay? Okay. When are you moving to Montana to get the donkey? <laughs> get the donkey. What donkey are you talking about? Anyway, folks, yeah, there you have it. So it is, uh, wow, really something crazy going on here with the rainfall coming down. It's unbelievable, and it's supposed to continue through tomorrow. Really wreaking havoc on events, and no doubt we're going to have localized flooding here, to say the least. We will definitely have some flooding going on here in Pennsylvania as a consequence of all this water coming down. It is a deluge, a deluge. No, not the luge as in, you know, sliding down in the Olympics. Not the luge, but a deluge. It is a deluge, folks. I wonder if those words are linked from Latin. They must be luge and deluge. Must be linked somehow in Latin that we just don't realize. Anyway, yeah. Um, I hope you're all doing well around the world today. It is... Um, <laughs> Man, I, I, let me see. There we go. We'll wipe the screen a little bit there. You guys can see that? There you go. Enjoy Wyoming, says Dylan. <laughs> well, Wyoming's a lovely place. Every time I'm in Wyoming, I absolutely love it and have a great experience there. Casper, okay. Cheyenne, I love Cheyenne. And I really like uh, out west, Star Valley and everything above it. I actually kind of got a little bit of a hankering and liking to the Wind River area because... Um, I heard it could be snowing. That's correct, Gus. Possible. Yep, it could be snowing. It did snow in parts of America from this storm. This is some massive storm that blew in from the Pacific, and we're over here on the other side of the continent being affected by it. That's crazy. I mean, it's that's a it's a huge storm. It makes me think of storms on on Jupiter or Saturn, man. No solar credit today. No solar credit yesterday. Nope. 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 When you see the animals marching two by two, they begin to worry. Says Marilyn. Yeah. No, I know, Dylan. Um, yeah, no, it, what do you do? That's what I said. I mean, I, 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 it's not just raining cats and dogs. It's raining elephants, hippos, and giraffes as well. Here they come landing all over. <laughs> you got to be careful with them. Yeah, it is. Wow. Crazy. Standard procedure all over the world. The captain of a ship does not pilot in or out of combined space. Uh, you know, you are correct in your statement there, Mark, but it's uh, the definition of confined space. That's an open channel. So, you know, um, I'm not really sure that applies. The harbor pilot is necessary to be there when they leave. If you look at a map of where, where that ship came from, it came from the uh, place where the stevedores work on the east side of Patapsco River beyond the bridge. And then the ship fully loaded heads directly north. You can't, you can only go so far because you're running short. Goes directly north and does a 180 turn and then comes back. And it comes back for some distance before it ever goes through the bridge. And I'm not sure at what point the harbor master and the tugs released. The tugs weren't there. The tugs were, were pulled back. And I think when the tugs are pulled back is when is when the harbor folks are no longer responsible. They wouldn't pull the tugs until they lose responsibility. So I don't know the answer on that, Mark. Maybe you've got the answer on that. But, but um, I know that I've uh, been following that two pilots were on board. All right. Okay, Mark, I'm not going to argue with you if you, you, you got the answer. I, I'm not saying I'm the expert there. Yep. Not I watch for Paula Paula phone. Yep. I just know that I know the area, but I'm not an expert when it comes to harbor operations. I have experience working with stevedores and working with ships uh, and loading tanks and uh, trucks and things on them. Comment on the CERN particle cellar reactivating my breath. I didn't know that it was shut down. Wow. When do we shut down the the CERN particle accelerator. I didn't know that was even shut down. No, I don't think comment on it because I didn't know it was shut down. I mean, last time I saw, you know, Sheldon Cooper was on his way over to Switzerland. <laughs> uh, pilot goes with the ship out to sea, then gets picked up by helicopter. Okay, Charles. All right, thanks for that. All I know is in Durban, when I was there last time down on the beach, I watched the, one of the handful of South African ships of sea in the Navy steam out to sea, go out about three kilometers, stop, and turn around and go back to port. And that was how they got their sea time, I guess, and accounted for um, their extra pay. All right, so, yeah, no, this this Baltimore thing, we're going to see what happens. Lots of rumors running around. I mean, the silly rumors are this DEI thing. People need to stop that. That's just nonsense. Um, look, there's, you know, didn't earn it is definitely something that is an issue in U.S. government. But this is a U.S. government operation. This was a commercial operation for a company based in Singapore and a ship that belonged to Mar uh, Marisk, by my understanding. It was just being leased and then um, operated by Indians. Anyway, so, yeah, DEI, come on, that's silly. As far as um, a cyber attack, um, 
I'm sure that's not beyond the realm of possibility, but there have been people making that claim, but I've seen no evidence of it yet, but things may have developed while I was inside a secure facility all morning, so who knows. Drop the pilot, Joan, what's this? Is that Arctic? Oh, it's ants, okay, that oh, was Arctic. Yeah, so I, I don't know, hey Fleshing, how's it going? In the 15 minute city of Oxford. Yep, so anyway. Yeah, it's, um, this thing is a disaster, folks. It's an absolute disaster. And it's going to affect our economy. It's going to affect other countries around the world as traffic is diverted to other ports and they're overburdened and lead to more delays, a la the Rona uh, situation when we had no stevedores and ships backed up outside the port of Long Beach in Southern California and here on the East Coast in Jacksonville and Baltimore and other places, Norfolk, where they couldn't get it. Um, strange that the ship was also carrying toxic chemicals. Um, I don't know. That sounds like a conspiracy thing. I'm sure they had toxic chemicals. Probably also had laptops on it, and that stuff is not good. Um, what I didn't see is, is did containers actually fall in the water? Someone said they did, but I can't see it. Since there are quick response naval vessels in the harbor, is the reason for the federal government no, claim of ownership? No. Uh, I, I don't know about that. It doesn't belong to the federal government. And this is lunacy uh, by Joe Biden saying that we're going to pay to build the bridge as citizens. No, that's nonsense. The insurance and reinsurance companies and the carrier need to pay for that. I don't care about this 1851 uh, maritime law. This is this is unbelievable. I mean, if, if that's an 1851 law and it's a precedent that's still being followed to this day, it is a mistake. These ships can do damage to facilities and infrastructure far in excess of the value of the ship. I mean, you know, back in the day, there was there was no Key Bridge or Chesapeake Bay Bridge that they had to go under or around. They just sailed in the harbor and they're little wooden ships. So that's no longer the case. I mean, these are Leviathans. These are massive ships. I mean, did you see how many containers are stacked up on that thing? Think about all those containers and how much weight is inside them. That's crazy. Yep. They get in those team, they get maneuvered by the... Yeah, well, that's the one question I had. Is Mark still here? It's a question I had. What I didn't understand with this whole thing is that, and I've never understood this with the Key Bridge, is the Key Bridge, the Patapsco River, the channel, it's a wide river, but the channel in the center is the only place that's deep enough to carry ships of this size with such a deep draft. Um, so what I've never understood is why the tugs don't stay with the ship until it's past the Key Bridge and then meet them at the key bridge and guide them through the key bridge. You know, so I've never understood that. Um, look, I've been over that bridge so many times, so many times. Not recently. Uh, I don't think I've been over it since COVID, but so many times I've been over it. Local election soon, there's what amounts to an independence party standing against the 15-minute city. Oh, that's good news. Good news on that. Curious emergency clearance on the deep channel. Yeah. Well, we'll see. The pilot is dropped on the ship out at sea by helicopter once again. I've actually been on the helicopter when they dropped off the pilot. Charles, and what did they do before the advent of helicopters? How did they handle that? No tugs and oversight by the authorities. Oversight. I'm not sure what you're saying, Mark. What that means. Yeah, it's a questionable thing in my mind. I mean, it's, it seems to me quite obvious that the tugboats should have been and always should have been responsible for getting those huge ships through the channel um, on the Bay Bridge, uh, not the Bay Bridge, gosh, uh, the, the Key Bridge, back and forth. Um, that's crazy. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen next time I go down there. I, I oftentimes don't go on the Key Bridge, but but I go on to BW, um, Baltimore Washington Parkway, not BW Parkway, excuse me, Ritchie Highway. Ritchie Highway is just a couple miles from where that bridge is at. Yeah, I'm getting spam text messages from people. <laughs> Sending me a note, so uh, it's uh, I think it's um, catfishing going on there. Eventually, a power outage is small but exists. Well, that's true. Yeah, it's true, Mark. Same thing with aircraft. <laughs> Fifty minutes used to be called transit-oriented districts to entice developers with grants. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, folks, I was going back through the conscience of a conservative. Um, it's uh, fresh water. Yeah, it's, it's fresh water. Tapsco River. As you go further down the Chesapeake Bay, it becomes um, a mix of brackish water at some point, and you get salt that comes in from the ocean. But at that stage, it's all fresh water up there um, in the um, northern part of the Chesapeake Bay. The Chesapeake Bay is one of the largest estuaries in the world. If not, well, camp, I don't think it's the largest, but it might be. It's one of the largest, yeah. 
Oh, Mark is saying it's an oversight, so they they it's it's they neglected to do it, is what you're saying. Okay, I want to make sure I understood. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, it was definitely, uh, and that's a, that's a question I raised immediately. And frankly, driving across that bridge in the past, I've wondered about this, seeing these big ships pass underneath. I guess I've been lucky it never happened when I was on the bridge. You know, we're also very fortunate that this occurred at one twenty-eight in the morning, folks. My goodness, if that had happened at seven thirty in the morning, whew, there'd be a lot more dead people. A lot more dead people. Can you imagine that? Or at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, rush hour traffic. The Key Bridge handled at least 34,000 passengers per day. I'm trying to remember what the last last time I paid the toll was a couple bucks or something like that. They're making tens of thousands of dollars per day off of vehicles going over that. And now they've lost that revenue on top of the bridge being down. Not to mention all the jobs have been put in jeopardy for stevedores and for businesses and transport companies. And yeah, it's just, wow. The devastating impact of the Francis Scott Key Bridge not to mention the, the the devastating impact that it likely will not be rebuilt with the name Francis Scott Key because the woke hate wankers are going to try to stop that from happening. Uh, these people live in a delusional world in which they think that uh, apparently slavery was invented in America and is a uniquely American institution perpetrated uniquely by pale-skinned individuals, which none of which is true. Um, slavery was a global institution, an absolutely global institution, and in the United States would have been unique from a standpoint had it begun its history as a country by banning slavery. Now, Haiti is unique in the fact that when the Haitians raped, murdered, slaughtered the 40,000 French living on Haiti in the revolution, they declared their own country in 1803 or thereabouts, they banned slavery. But then it was a country that was controlled by bloodthirsty, murdering, rapacious former slaves who wanted to ensure that no one else was enslaved. So they were the first to ever ban slavery as a country. The United States did not ban it initially, but eventually got around to banning with the 13th Amendment on the 6th of December, 1865. Anyway, Barry Goldwater's conscience of a conservative, uh, looking through that again, um, it's just it's amazing how prescient he is and how the same problems that Barry Goldwater confronted in the 1950s and 1960s remain with us today, and they're even worse today. What's this? Should know better, despite traveling, you still broadcast. Oh, what do you mean, Debbie? Oh, because you came in late? It's fine. No worries. I, I always try to try to do the broadcast, whether I'm traveling or not. I mean, I feel an obligation to my audience to do the best I can. A lot of people are tuning in. They, that, I guess they're popping in and in and out here a couple seconds. Uh, I don't know what this broadcast is, and I guess I'm not sexy enough to keep them hanging around here. So let me... Maybe that'll improve my sexual appeal. <laughs> Jan says, uh, Haiti, they also killed the mixed race slave. Yes, they did. They did. They also killed them as well. And then when Napoleon tried to recapture the island with French troops, he lost another 40,000 soldiers who were killed in the conflict. The Haitians held on their independence. But they're the first country in the world to ban slavery. The United States um, would have been unique in declaring it. It would have been perhaps nice if they'd done it, but people forget that we wouldn't have had a country. We would not have had a country. Yeah, I do need some clickbait. Um... Yeah, um, we wouldn't have had a country if we'd not had the compromises that we had that allowed for the eventual elimination. But here's the thing. Slavery became unprofitable um, eventually, and it was just going to die off as an institution just for the free market. The free market would not have, would tolerate slavery because it was not profitable. The amount of money that was invested in slaves, the amount of money that was put in there proved to be detrimental. Slavery was only made possible because of the cotton gin. I mean, it was possible, but it was only made highly profitable because of the development of the cotton gin, which removed the seeds. Slaves were needed to pull the seeds out, and then the cotton gin came along, and slaves were able to use for other things. So it's, you know, it's, uh, Napoleon lost, yeah, it was 40,000, if I remember correctly, Debbie. Yeah, 40,000, he sent 40,000 troops that were killed there. Something like that. Yeah, but 40,000, so look, Haiti was an island full of white folks at one point, full of white folks just like much of the Caribbean is full of white folks. So when you watch shows like Death in Paradise and you find the island's inhabitants are a mix of Afro-Caribbean, mixed race, brown folks, plus you see a lot of white folks there that aren't just tourists, they live on the islands because the Caribbean is full of white folks. I mean, but there were many more. Tropical diseases took their toll. Alexander the Hamilton was born in, I believe it was Bahamas, and he was born in the Caribbean and then migrated to the United States. So not a natural born American citizen. Anyway, but uh, the Caribbean, you know, West Africa would be full of white folks like Southern Africa too, if only it weren't for tropical diseases like dengue fever, Lassa fever, and most especially malaria, which just wiped out the white folks like crazy. Countless cash crop that was back when there was economy. Hamilton was born in St. Croix. Is it St. Croix, Menagerie? Okay. 
Uh, Bahamas, St. Croix. Okay, well then, yeah. All right. But St. Croix wasn't owned by America at the time. Thank you. Uh, for some reason, I thought it was Bahamas. But yeah, he was born down there. Um, no. Um, cash crop was, was not the backbone of the U.S. economy. That's an overstatement. An overstatement. It was the backbone of the economy of southern states, hands down. But the industrialization of America ensured that the heart and lifeblood of our economy was actually the Northeast. And then as we spread into the Midwest, it became Midwest. Yep. So, yeah, no, it wasn't the lifeblood. It was an important factor. But, um, you know, uh, Britain and France contemplated entering the Civil War on behalf of the Confederacy because cotton was important. But they wound up getting alternate supplies of cotton from like Brazil and elsewhere which uh, convinced them that they didn't need the South, and so they never did enter the war on the side of the Confederacy, which doomed the Confederacy. And the fact that also they had only a handful of people, and three times the population was in the North. I mean, you know, uh, Minaj, from your standpoint, it doesn't even make sense um, that um, the industrialized North, which had a population three times as large as the South, including slaves, that the lifeblood of the economy would have been, the backbone of the economy was cotton. It was definitely a big factor that played a role. Now, we get that from the revisionist historians and the black supremacists all the time telling us how how the whole country was tied up the slave trade from shipbuilders to reinsurance corporations to, to insurance corporations to all these other things. Yeah, railroads, yeah, all of that played a role. But, you know, it's, it's you know, it's, it's look... You can just do the same thing to talk about corn production. You can do the same thing talking about canal building. You can do the same thing talking about steel industry and coal industry as they came along. Yep. I highly recommend the book, The War Before the War, Fugitive Slaves and the Struggle for America by Andrew Del Bunco. All right. Well, all right. Thank you for that, Minaj. You have to remind me another time when I'm, I've had quite a few white Caribbeans here, says Fleshing. Yep. Hi, Chris. Good information being shared here. Thanks, Patron. Yeah, um, I don't know the book, by Menage Qua. Thank you for the recommendation. Hopefully, I can remember that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the the, uh, the Haitians, uh, they rose up and they overthrew their oppressors. But it was a bloody, horrific, unbelievably violent. But, I mean, look, the French were, were terrible, terrible slave owners. I mean, they, and I'm not saying they brought on themselves. Certainly, children and women didn't deserve the fate that, they, that befell them when the Haitians rose up. But... But, I mean, it was understandable that there was such animosity and hatred there. And the Haitians, you know, they, they successfully, it was the one slave revolt that actually succeeded. The slave revolt that led to the independence of Haiti was the one slave, result, or slave revolt that actually was successful. We had slave revolts in America, none of which were ultimately successful. Okay. Southern states had their own culture, but the North was very industrialized by the start of the war. As you said, the majority of people in the North, well, three times the population. I mean, there were only about seven, eight million people, in the, not even that many in the South, and there were over 21 million people living in the North at that stage in 1860. A uh, huge difference and massive industrialization. And the country was moving westward. So, yeah, look, slavery is an abomination. Unfortunately, it continues today, and more people today live in slavery than at any point in history. More, at least 75 million people living in some form of um, servitude, involuntary servitude, and whether it's kids forced to break ships apart in India, or it is people trafficking to sex work in America, in Europe, in South Africa. It's horrible. It's horrible. Ginger tea. Oh, sorry to hear that, um, Debbie. I hope you feel better. Yeah, no, it's um, it's it's nasty, nasty. It's it's an abomination. And what gets me is is these people with their revisionist history, their nonsense going on about things. Yeah, you know, it's like the 1619 project. You know, these people are just race hustling, nasty people, who just can't deal with the reality of history. Uh, said she was a bunch of criminals, uh, what's this, once broke into a car, if you speak of the Belgians in the Congo, um, Garrett, I've talked about, um, King Leopold, and the thing about the Belgian Congo that people don't realize, it wasn't a Belgian colony, at least not initially, eventually it became one, but the Belgian Congo was the personal property of King Leopold, wow. The tiny amount of what? Of uh, black folk at the time was minute compared. Well, yes, compared to the entire population of the United States, but compared to the population of southern states, no, 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 no. In fact, South Carolina at one point was majority slave. Um, yeah. Confederates, the British were about to help them in the Civil War, but when they realized they could get cheaper cotton from Egypt, they decided not to interfere. Exactly, Najaqua. I did say Brazil. Egypt was a source of cotton as well. Yeah, and today China is the world's largest. Uh, cotton producer, if I'm not mistaken. I have to double check my stats, but uh, Brazil and China. United States is a big cotton producer, but not the top cotton producer. 
uh, it's it's done elsewhere. So, yeah. Anyway, but um, yeah, it's uh, I, there was a train of thought I had there a minute ago. I lost it. So, can't believe uh, kid slavery still right in this day. It is. It is. Well, the sexual slavery is the thing I find incredibly disturbing. I mean, you know, the the the, the mental welfare of of women and, and children. Um, just completely obliterated, destroyed by the sex trafficking and their, their bodies used and sold, sexually transmitted infections, um, cancers as a result of getting those things and, you know, unwanted pregnancies, lives completely obliterated by this thing. And the people that do it are incredibly powerful, wealthy, connected, and they buy off officials the world over. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it is a frightening, frightening world. And it happens all the time. Got to tell you here, though, but um, where I'm at in central Pennsylvania, the effects of this criminal alien invasion are now being felt with an influx of people who are not from this area, who are not citizens, who are not legitimate asylum seekers, yet they are all over the place. Um, I was greeted at the local shopping store, the grocery store, a few days ago by panhandlers, beggars, who were begging for money, holding up a sign in English on a piece of cardboard saying, please help with my family, we need money. And uh, the two of them were there playing music obnoxiously loud, disturbing the peace, standing next to the, um, the drugstore uh, near where the grocery store was, and had to walk past them and hear the annoying music being played. Now, he had an amplifier. I don't have an amplifier. Nice speaker, big speaker amplifier playing this music. And when I came back to the car and I sat down, uh, he'd stop for a little bit, took a little break, and I saw him pull out his iPhone. He's begging for money. And he's using an iPhone and an amplifier. When you were in Niger, did you do any projects against human No, I didn't. That was not my responsibility, Menage Qua. Uh, projects against human trafficking. No, that's not something I did. In Niger, what I did was um, help the FAN, the Force Armée Nigerienne, with training uh, to be a responsible civil government. Apparently, that didn't go so well because they overthrew the government. But um, did that training as well as equipping them with, with um, military resources they needed to combat human trafficking to combat um, goods trafficking and to protect their borders against um, international terror groups, things like that. Uh, so also started the drone program when I was there and did a few other things. But no, I was not involved in that. As a military officer, my reach and limit into those fields is, is, is constrained. The authorities were only allowed to do things that were allowed to do by law. And we do have a program called the Humanitarian Assistance Program which allows us to do projects. But to be honest with you, the purpose of projects is to curry good favor, to build relations in communities and get us access uh, so we can get in and around places when we need to talk to people who need help. Uh, we do intend to do good things with it, but there's a, there's, there's a payoff for it. The military building a school or a clinic or an HIV counseling center, the purpose of that is to get the good graces of people locally so that when we need to do something, we can do it. It's not simply entirely humanitarian. Look, no such thing as a free lunch. Nobody does anything out of the goodness of their heart. Even people who do have the goodness of their heart do so for that warm feeling or for, you know, when you get to the pearly gates and St. Peter comes up so they can get in the gates of heaven. But um, true humanitarianism is non existent. There's quid pro quo for everything. Um, so I was happy to do those projects. They were fantastic. Why can Gate McKenzie claim to be the next president of our country and he has been in jail? Ah, very simple, uh, Helen, because your law and I can be corrected by this. Um, yeah, public diplomacy, that's correct. But but the military engaged in public diplomacy. So wear a black 5.11 jack and pull your camera out. What's this? Oh, come on, get on my screen, they will scatter, yeah. Um, okay, so Gate McKenzie. The law in South Africa is if you've been convicted of a crime over 12 months within five years. I'm pretty sure that's what the law is. So Gate McKenzie was convicted of a felony over five years ago, served his time, and so that five-year statute of limitations has expired. So Gate McKenzie can now run for office. Unfortunately for Jacob Zuma, he was convicted in June 29th, on June 29th of 2021. So 22, 23, 24. We haven't even reached three years. So he's still got two plus years of being banned from serving in government. So his time is not now. That's why Gate McKenzie can run and claim he's going to be the next president, but he's delusional. He's not going to be the next president any more than John Steenhuisen is going to be the next president of South Africa, but he's not claiming that, Steenhuisen to his credit. Yeah, if, 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 if somehow the multi-party charter uh, for South Africa actually managed to form a government at the national level, then it would be Hlabisa from the IFP, most likely. Lasagna. Mm. 
cool beans. All right, folks, that's an hour. 67 likes, that's it. 62 people here. Uh, my reading glass is starting to hurt my eyes here. Uh, so I'm going to take a break and head back in. I'll catch you all later. Hopefully, I won't see Noah and his ark at some point today because this is bat crap crazy. And hopefully, no damage is done to my house. I'll check my basement tonight, make sure there are no leaks, and we'll see how it goes. All right, take care, you folks. God bless. Catch you later. And thanks for being here. All right, appreciate your support for the program. Have a good day, folks.